Imagine yourself moving into a house with a huge picture window overlooking a lake with a grand view of mountains beyond. Snow-capped mountains, beautiful mountains. You have a ringside seat before all of this beauty. The cloud formations, the wild storms, the entire spectrum of sun-illuminated colors in the rocks and the trees and the wildflowers and the water. At first, you're just captivated by this view. You sit, you stand, you look, you admire, you catch your breath. Several times a day, you interrupt your work and stand before this window to take in the majesty, the beauty. And then one day, you notice some bird droppings on the glass and you get a bucket of water and a towel and you clean it. A couple of days later, a rainstorm leaves the window streaked and the bucket comes out again. One day, some visitors with a tribe of small, dirty-fingered children come and the moment they leave, you notice there are smudge marks all over the windows. They're hardly out of the door before you have the bucket out again. You're so proud of that window. And it's such a large window. But it's incredible how many different ways foreign objects can attach themselves to that window, obscuring the vision, distracting from the vision. Keeping that window clean now becomes an obsessive compulsive neurosis. You accumulate ladders and buckets and squeegees. You construct a scaffolding outside and one inside. And you have to get to all the difficult corners and heights. You end up having the cleanest window in North America, but it's now been years since you looked through it. You've become a Pharisee. Because of this slow change over a couple of hundred years, from an interior passion to an exterior performance, this shift of attention from the majesty of God to house cleaning for God, the Pharisees of the time of Herod and Jesus were not as a group very attractive. All the same, they did represent the best of Judaism. They at least were in touch with their heritage. They knew they were Jews first and always. They studied their scriptures. They knew them inside and out, and they were proud heirs of this vigorous and fierce preservation of Jewish identity. The gospel story is brightened by the names of three Pharisees, Nicodemus, Joseph of Arimathea, and Gamaliel. Now, if Jesus had been looking for allies, a group to align himself with, I think the Pharisees were the obvious choice. They had the best track record in Palestine. They had proved their sincerity and loyalty to the demands and promises of God most wonderfully. They were the strongest and most determined party of resistance to the world of leadership that had come to a head in Herod. And Herod, by this time, the, the world had moved from Greek politics to Roman politics, and Herod was the mass evangelist for the Greek gospel of civilization. Think of Herod as the Billy Graham of the Greek gospel, holding mass crusades in his many amphitheaters around Palestine. Against Herod and all that he represented, the Pharisees stood their ground. They had become a little rigid, true. They needed some reforming, some livening, livening up, but they could very well serve as a solid base, reliable base to work from. But Jesus no more took his cue from the intensity of the Pharisees than he did from the grandiosity of Herod. There was so much to admire in the Pharisees. Every Jew owed a debt of gratitude to the Pharisees for keeping his or her Jewish identity alive. I don't think we appreciate the Pharisees nearly enough. I really don't. I think they need to be honored far more than has been common among Christians. All the same, it's obvious that Jesus did not work out of a Pharisee context. 
If you're one of those people who is impressed by the Herod style of leadership and heard Jesus say, follow me, took him up on it and started following, the first thing I think you would have noticed is that you would be plunged immediately into a world of relationships, an intricate, shimmering web of persons and God. You would have left the world of size and numbers, huge, beautiful buildings, famous celebrities, lavish spectacles, noise, violence, and crowds, and walked into a world of personal names, personal encounters, personal conversations, personal meetings, and a personal God. On the other hand, if you're one of the people who is impressed with the Pharisees, and heard Jesus say, follow me, and took him up on it and started following, I think the first thing you might notice is his use of language, the way he talked. Jesus' characteristic way of talking was in story. Jesus told stories, we call them parables, and he used metaphors. A story is the use of words that creates involvement and relationship. Stories take the stuff of our everyday life as lived and carry us into the actions that constitute our experience. The people we love or hate, the jobs we do well or badly, the way parents and children behave, decisions that we face. If the storyteller is good, we often hear or notice something that's going on right now as I'm living my life, but I'd missed it. Now that I see it, I can live my life better, enjoy a pleasure more deeply, be aware of a danger more vigilantly, grasp an opportunity that I was unaware of, appreciate a person I hadn't thought was really worth spending any time with. Sometimes a storyteller will recast what it means to be a man or a woman in such a way that we see ourselves and the people around us so differently that we get a fresh burst of energy to plunge back in and do something, the old thing, in a brand new way. We had maybe concluded that we were at a boring dead end, and then the storyteller reveals love or conflict or values in a way that engages us at an entirely different level. Storytellers imagine alternate ways of living and wake up our imaginations to who we and our neighbors are in fresh ways. We are stimulated to live more intensely, more aware, and Jesus told a lot of these stories which did just that. Pharisees, on the other hand, used language to define and defend. They were famous for their rules and regulations, they discussed endlessly the rights and wrongs of various behaviors. They studied scripture and pored over the meaning of each syllable and punctuation mark, worrying the text like a dog with a bone. They used language seriously and colorlessly. They couldn't waste time telling stories. That would be frivolous. Their Hebrew and biblical background was rich in stories but they had more important things to do than tell stories. They had to give people no-nonsense instructions on what to do and when and where. Well, the contrast in the two ways of using language is unmistakable. And a good instance of, of the difference is um, the, that incident when a man asked Jesus to define neighbor. Pharisees loved definitions. And Jesus answered him with a story, the story of the Samaritan. They could have split hairs over a definition far into the night, but the story that Jesus told pulled the man into becoming a neighbor or not, and not bloodlessly, abstractly defining the neighbor. And Jesus also used metaphor. He told us that we are salt 
and light. He told us that he was bread and a door. Much of the time, people had no idea what he was talking about. The literal-minded Pharisees had a particularly hard time. Nicodemus was typical. What do you mean, born again? That's impossible. Talk sense, please. A metaphor is literally a lie. It's simply not true. You are not salt. If I sprinkle you on my breakfast eggs, the taste is not improved. <laughs> I am not light. If I walk into a dark room, nothing is illuminated. God is not a rock. Geologists don't examine rocks looking for fossil evidence of God or write learned papers arguing for key Precambrian revelation of God. So why do we speak in metaphors? Why was Jesus so fond of metaphors? Why is the Bible so profuse in metaphor? When we first ask these questions, it does seem odd because metaphors are not precise. A metaphor can be understood in several different ways. If Jesus was interested primarily in precision, he certainly would not have gone around saying things such as, I am the vine and you are the branches, or feed my lambs. But after a little reflection, we realize that a metaphor does a couple of remarkable things that are at the heart of both language itself and the gospel. One is that a metaphor requires participation if you're going to get it. When Jesus says, I am the good shepherd, <clears throat> our minds go into action. A picture forms in our mind. Associations spring up. The phrase begins to live. A metaphor is a compressed story, and it begins releasing energies and insights. And as the metaphor embeds itself in our consciousness, we begin to tell the story that involves us. It's difficult to be passive in the presence of a metaphor. Metaphor makes it difficult to be a bystander coolly watching the action. Metaphor pulls us into an involved participation in what the writer or speaker of the metaphor is about. And metaphor involves us in a web of meanings. In this world of God's creation and salvation, <clears throat> Everything is connected. The world is not a vast flea market of stuff from the basements and attics and closets of homes and towns all over the world that we sort through to find what might suit us just now at this time in our lives. It's more like a complex and intricate organism, a creation and covenant in which there is meaning and purpose everywhere you look and those meanings and purposes connected heaven and earth, what you see and what you don't see, everything you touch, every sound you hear. Metaphor is the use of a word in such a way that it involves us in the intricate interconnectedness that is inherent in God's creation and covenant. Everything has something to do with something else. And if you follow it far enough, it has to do with you or with God or both, both usually. Pruning vines and branches and feeding lambs is part of the same world in which Jesus is revealing God to us and working out our salvation. The Pharisees, in their commitment to keep the truth exact and stay separated from the world, used a language that was as impersonal and controlled as possible. Jesus, no less committed to the truth and no less concerned about the dangers of the world, used language, language that was intensely personal and relational and participatory. Stories that make us realize that we are involved in a plot with characters in which God is working out our salvation and the salvation of the world. Metaphors that get us into the action, thinking and praying with all our souls and minds and strength. When Jesus says, follow me, and we follow, he rescues us from the leadership of Herod that becomes effective by depersonalizing, 
by functionalizing, and he rescues us from the Pharisee alternative that achieves truth by using language that avoids personal participation, avoids being connected with the entirety of God's creation and covenant. 